Welcome to the Red Light Report, your number one source for all things red light therapy, where you will learn how to optimize your health, wellness, and longevity with the power of photobiomodulation. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Belkowski. All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the Red Light Report. This week, we have two people on the call for the price of one episode. It is the Biohacker Babes. Renee Bells and Lauren Sambatero. Lauren and Renee grew up in a health driven family that prioritized the fundamentals of wellness and self care. Their father, George, the original biohacker and pioneer of holistic dentistry, taught them the importance of individualization and experimentation from a very young age. Coming together as health entrepreneurs, Renee, a certified nutritional consultant and holistic lifestyle coach with a master's degree in nutrition, and Lauren, a Broadway performer, corrective exercise specialist, and functional health coach, feel a strong passion and drive to not only share each other of their health journeys towards wellness, but their strategy and motivation to discover our unique bodies through the world of biohacking. Their podcast, The Biohacker Babes, aims to create insight into the body's natural healing abilities, strengthen your intuition, and empower you with techniques and modalities to optimize your health and wellness. So without further ado, Renee and Lauren, welcome to the Red Light Report. Thanks Thank for you so much us. for having us. <laughs> Perfectly in sync. <laughs> <laughs> we tend to do that. <laughs> That'll be the challenge to determine who is speaking throughout. Uh, we already sounded like... Each other's voices. <laughs> <laughs> well, for, for the listener's sake, let's have Renee speak first. Let's hear your story, Renee, how you got into health and wellness. What was the kind of tipping point or the aha moment that really got you to uh, interested in biohacking? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I always like to start with the story of growing up in our healthy household. So our, our dad, Dr. Sambatero, biological dentist, um, and our mom being really health conscious, we kind of grew up in a biohacking household without even knowing it was biohacking. So we have some funny stories of seeing our dad using a vibration plate and low level laser therapy and all these things back in the nineties where we were like, we don't really know what any of that is, but you know, if we ever had a knee pain or some kind of injury, our dad would be whipping out some kind of technology and fixing us up. But then we both went off to college and I actually ended up while well, I was studying international business, had no interest in any kind of health career. I didn't think I was interested in that at all, but I ended up kind of crashing and burning the typical like adrenal, what we used to think was adrenal fatigue kind of story. And I had to pretty much biohack my way back to health. Um, at the time, you know, my early twenties, I was eating like the perfect clean diet. I was exercising every day. I was sleeping plenty of hours every night and I still didn't feel well. So that kind of led me down this journey of looking at what else is out there, you know, cool things like light therapy and things to support your parasympathetic nervous system, heavy metal detoxing, getting down to the really root cause of uh, chronic infections in my body. So just kind of discovering all these things. And I became so passionate about it. I ended up switching my career and becoming uh, more into the nutrition and health coaching side of things. And then Lauren and I, a couple of years ago, thought, why not team up? I'll let Lauren share her story too, but we decided to team up as the biohacker babes because we just felt like we needed more women in the biohacking space. You know, there's a lot of people dealing with chronic health issues. They don't have the answers or there's the other side of the spectrum of people that really just want to optimize and take their health to the next level. And we wanted to be kind of guidance uh, for some people out there about that. So we started the podcast and it's been a blast for the last three years doing that together. That's pretty darn cool that you were kind of born into it in the sense, like you said, you were surrounded by these early on biohacking tools that, like you said, early on weren't called biohacking, but your dad was just this, it sounds like an experimenter and just wanting to tweak and pull levers and pulleys to like improve health and wellness in different ways. So Lauren, let's hear your story. Um, If you have anything specific about your father, because he sounds like an interesting guy, and then your path to where you got today as far as biohacking. He's a Really interesting guy. And you would love to meet him. What we really learned as kids and growing up in that house is I think our subconscious minds really picked up on the fact that we have to always ask questions. Uh, it, to me, that's the root of biohacking is not taking no for an answer, stepping back to that 30,000 foot perspective, and then just continuing to ask questions because rarely do we get the answer immediately. 
Uh, Renee and I talk a lot about root causes. There's rarely one root cause. It's a system of systems. We really have to to step back. And I, I hit hurdles not really employing that in my early 20s. So similar to Renee, I had what was called adrenal burnout. And I had, you know, the all too common narrative living in New York City. I was a personal trainer out of college. And I was told that you have to wake up at 4 a.m., start training your clients at 5, 6 a.m. You have to work, work, work all day. Don't take a break. And I found that that just wasn't sustainable. Not that you can't give and serve and empower people in that way. I just knew that that was not right for me because I was very quickly burning out. Uh, my cup was quite empty. My vitality, my my motivation for living really just felt pretty diminished. So I knew that there had to be another way. And so I think maybe I got away from lessons that I learned from my dad and actually my mom as well early on. I think I circled back and I thought there's got to be another way. There is definitely another way. And stepping back and looking at possible root causes, like what are the underlying stressors that is causing this burnout? You know, there's a million different answers. We rarely have dysfunction in one part of the body. And so it was one, taking a step back and doing some education, looking at textbooks and, and research, but also a little bit of trial and error to see what was working for me. Because with biohacking, you know, everything is extremely personal. So I wasn't going to be able to find the answer online. I had to employ research and integrate that with quantification to figure out what was the perfect puzzle piece for me. Interesting. So it sounds like you, uh, Lauren, and especially, uh, well, both of you were in this lifestyle where you're kind of burning the candle at both ends. And I think that's kind of the mindset in, especially the U S like you said, Lauren, mm-hmm. you work, 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 uh, you give, 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 but at what point do you step back in and recover for yourself, whether it's mentally or physically. And so I think a lot of people go through life doing that week in and week out year in and year out until you're something breaks, you know, Ben don't break, but then eventually something will break because you're not giving your body what it needs to recover and heal and recharge. And so that kind of beckons the question. And I love asking biohackers this, what is your morning routine? Because the morning kind of sets the day, sets the tone for the rest of the day. So I'd love to hear from both of you. Let's start with you, Lauren, since Renee went first the first time. What is your morning routine? What do you do to kind of set the day, whether it's nutrition or mentally or physically? What do you do? So I wake up at the same time every day. I think the only exception there is if I've had and a rare night where I stay out a little bit later, I do give myself a little bit grace so I can not throw myself into a sleep debt. But on most days, there's consistency with my wake up time. And I find with that, I don't really need an alarm clock. My body knows when to wake up. I would say I kind of have an anti routine. I more just have time and space to listen to my body and then do what my body tells me that I need. And that can range from anything from meditating to breath work. I like to go up to my roof or maybe take a walk to get direct light exposure. My apartment doesn't have a ton of natural light, so I try to get outside. But I've tried over the years like a very regimented morning routine. It's like you got to do X, Y, and Z before 8 o'clock or you're not productive or you're going to have a terrible day. And I just think that sets you up for some failure or some, some disappointment in yourself. And that's not what we need to be starting our day with. We need to be confident and feeling motivated and proud of ourselves. And so I think giving that time and space just to listen to your body and allow that feedback, and then it can change from day to day. So some variation. Say one thing I always do is I roll my feet. I have this addiction to my foot roller. <laughs> so there's always a foot roll. There's always lots of water. And then, you know, something that it feels nourishing to my body. So pretty intuitive, like you said, flexible, not regimented. So I like that. And by ball roller, do you mean the bottom of your foot kind of like rolling out the plantar fascia and some reflexology? Yes. Yes. So waking up all the nerves, we have like thousands of nerve endings in the bottoms of our feet. And I just find the rest of my body responds really well if I start with that. But my body tells me, I'm like, got to go to the roller. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah. Renee, let's hear from yeah. you. What do you do if you have any certain morning routine or if it's similar to Lauren's? Yeah, I, I, pretty similar to Lauren, I would say. Um, my number one thing is getting that morning sunshine. I, I have to. It's one of the main reasons I moved to Vegas three years ago is because I just need more sunlight in my life. So it's really easy. I just go in my backyard or up on my rooftop. I get that morning sun within 30 minutes of waking. So 
that's a non-negotiable. Also drinking my water and taking my morning supplements, which is usually a mix of some liposomal formulas and some adaptogenic herbs, get those into my body, get my sunlight. And then depending on my schedule, depending on how early I start, because since I am on the West coast and most of my clients are on the East coast, I kind of have to hit the ground running a little bit, but if I have time, I like to do like a brain tap meditation session. Uh, maybe I'll do my red light in the morning, kind of have to squeeze that in wherever I can just kind of intuitively yeah. figure it out. <laughs> so you both mentioned water and whenever people bring this up, I love talking about it. I just interviewed Tracy Dews, who's all about hydration and water. But I'd love to hear from you guys. When you say you drink water, do you guys do anything specific? Do you structure it? Do you do hydrogen rich? Do you do quinton water? What do you guys do for water, if anything? Yes, yes, and yes. (laughs) Uh, I have a Berkey water filter, which is my prized possession. I love it so much. My dog gets water from the Berkey ever since we got it. It's just everything that we consume, ice cubes, anything that goes into food comes from the Berkey. Like Tracy, I like to add some hydrogen and I'm a huge fan of the isotonic quinton. Pretty often that will end up in my Berkey water in the morning, a little hydrogen, a little quinton, but you know, I do like to rotate supplements. So every now and then it's just plain Berkey, which is delicious. For people who don't know, uh, what is Berkey? So it uses these really, really strong black carbon filters that filters out, I want to say everything. It's like 99.9%. I'm not sure the exact scientific research, but the box that the Berkey comes in lists every possible toxin chemical that you would prefer to have out of your water. I live in New York City. And for the longest time, there's this myth that New York City has the cleanest tap water. And then you go to EWG and it's like, beware, maybe you shouldn't be drinking this water. So for someone like me in a city, really, really important to filter that out. And I've noticed with my dog, he's like my little biohacking experiment. Sometimes he uses the red light and I've noticed that with the Berkey water, he has had a little less pain. He limps a little bit less. He's an older dog and his energy is just like a little bit better with that water. So interesting. So, so you filter the water with the Berkey and then do you add anything to it afterwards? Sometimes yes, or other times no. Like, what do you do with that? Yeah, sometimes the hydrogen and the quinton. I like that combination in the morning. Gotcha. And do you ever give your dog quinton? I haven't. Yeah, I reserve I that for myself. It's a little selfish. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're giving him the break. I should. So good. Yeah. Because <laughs> I've been giving. Um, I've been giving my puppy. I get the liter full, so I just put a little bit um, of hypertonic in his water every morning. So. Uh, just spreading the love to him a little bit, but so just keep it good enough. Yeah. Um, Very cool. so Renee, he heard you. So I'm going to now <laughs> <laughs> give it a try. <laughs> Renee, what do you do with water? Yeah. Um, I, so I use reverse osmosis. I had a filter put in the house when we moved in and same thing. I sometimes I'll do hydrogen. I don't do it every day because I like to rotate my supplements as well. And then Quinton, the hypertonic is my jam. The isotonic is great too, but the hypertonic, I get, get an immediate energy boost. So I like to do like one ampule in the morning and then I'll do one ampule before I do a sauna session a couple of times a week. Do you guys ever structure your water with uh, your red light therapy devices? Just out of curiosity. I have, it's definitely not a consistent practice. It's kind of like if I have the light on and I remember to do it. That's one that doesn't make it to the top of the priority list, but <laughs> I've no, enjoyed that's it. A when good I'm hack. Happy. You have to build yeah. it as a habit, but it's just like, if you did just have a buyer counter, depending on what size your device is, just having it, especially to the infrared, near infrared setting and just putting it the yeah. glass in front of there for, I don't know. Um, from what I read from Dr. Gerald Pollack's book, The Fourth Phase of Water, the way to structure water best is intensity and duration. So the closer you can put your glass of water Uh, to the device, provided it's not emitting a lot of EMFs for a longer period of time, theoretically, it'll structure it more. So just food for thought. Oh, I'm going to start doing that right away. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know the duration in which that lasts? You need to consume it right away or once it's structured, it it stays? That's a good question. I believe I asked Tracy that because she has one of those really nice vortexing things that structures the water. And she was under the impression it can last for hours through that vortices because water has a memory. It holds a memory. So until Mm -hmm. someone, something comes along and imposes a different memory, let's say it's sunlight or EMF exposure, then it's going to retain its structure for, for a decent amount of time, at least it's not nearly as quick, let's say as a hydrogen tablet where you need to drink it immediately because right. um, I guess releasing fast. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, actually, our, our dad has one that does that, and he even travels with it. I noticed when we travel with him, he has that in his suitcase. <laughs> He's always five steps ahead. <laughs> yes. Like a, yeah. 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 I mean, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So you can, you can structure it on the go. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do the red light though. Cause I actually have a small, cool. a small panel. It's low EMF. And so why not? Yeah. It's simple. And I noticed on your guys' website, you have some fun facts about you two that I, that I briefly read through. And I thought it was oh. interesting <laughs> as far as your favorite biohacks, Lauren, you said cold showers. And then Renee said infrared saunas. So you're like on complete opposite ends of the spectrum in a sense uh, there. So I'd love to hear, uh, let's start with you, Renee, why the infrared sauna? Yeah, this has been a running joke for years that we're the extremes in this case. I, I'm just drawn to heat. Again, another reason why I moved to the desert. The 120 degree weather doesn't bother me too much. Um, I've always felt really good in infrared saunas and it was a big part of my healing journey. I think helping with detoxing, especially the heavy metals I was dealing with, I would always notice after a session, my brain fog would be gone. I would feel more energetic. And I had a really hard time sweating when I was really sick. I was that person that just couldn't sweat no matter what I did. And the sauna kind of opened up the floodgates for me. So when I built my house last year, again, non-negotiable was, I told my husband, we have to get an infrared sauna. So we put one in the basement and I use it every other day. And I just love it. And we actually just recorded two podcasts. We did one all about cold therapy and one all about heat therapy. So we got to take turns with that. But I think the research behind the heat shock proteins is just phenomenal. I think Dr. Rhonda Patrick has a lot of great research on saunas as well. Um, I'm totally sold on that. I'm sold on the cold therapy too. It's just a little more painful <laughs> to get through it. Hey, about a Lord. Why, why cold showers? <laughs> I used to have a really hard time waking up in the morning and between natural light and cold, it's easy. I feel crazy for saying that, but it is easy to wake up. I don't always do cold first thing in the morning, but I discovered that it really is just a natural energy booster before you've had coffee. My brain feels alive, completely alive. And I just really don't like sweating as much. Renee doesn't mind it. I love heat. I love the desert heat, but I would prefer to shiver. Something about the shivering just makes me feel like a little more vital and, and awake. And we know it has very positive benefits on your metabolism, on fat burning, on brain function. So I love to stand underneath the shower filter and have the water right on my head. I've been playing a little bit more with some cold plunges in ice barrels. I have two friends that are like warriors with the cold and I'm not quite there, but I love the challenge of it. And I feel amazing after I sleep amazing. I recover better from my workouts. So similar to heat, there's just like unending research and also, you know, citizen science. I feel amazing. So I continue to do it. It is one of those things where you have to build up over time. For example, um, in Montana, I live, I don't know, a hundred yards from, from a river to the east of my house. And so I started off going, you know, um, as deep as I could into the water and it's ice cold because it's just glacial runoff from the mountains nearby. When I started off, I could get up to my neck for about five or 10 seconds. And that was it. You know, that was the end of my session. And then over time, I forget exactly how long, probably, you know, a month, month and a half, I was able to go up to my neck. Again, this is like, December, January in Montana. And I'd be in there for two or three minutes straight. And it gets to the point where you can be in there for almost, it seems like forever. And at that time I was dealing with some minor lower back pain, maybe some minor knee pain. And every time I did the cold water, my pain was gone like that. So mm. it's very cool. And I was, I was all about it too, for the mitochondrial benefits, but I noticed the pain would, was gone before I got out and it was gone the rest of the day, if not several days after one cold plunge. So I'm a big believer too. Um, and then Amazing. to your point, yeah, and then to your point, Renee, I have a sauna too. So not during the summer because I like to enjoy my cold mornings, but I don't get in the sauna then. Um, and I don't like getting in a sauna when it's a hundred degrees outside. But I from from fall to <laughs> spring, I'm using my sauna as well. So I love it. Yeah. Do you know how cold the water is outside? I haven't measured it, but that's a good question because it's cold. And it, Just capital cold. <laughs> -O -L -D. Um <laughs> Even coming out of our shower, because of course, again, we're right next to the, the mounds in, in a cold river. So when it comes out of the shower and you have it on cold, it is frigid cold. That's much easier than, than the cold plunge in some ways. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cold plunge is really intense, but it is amazing with that hormetic stress. I mean, the whole point of it is adaptation and it's incredible mm-hmm. over time with what you said, how your body gets used to it. And then you can just up level, up level, but it's all to your tolerance and like just a little bit beyond. I would become more tolerant, but I don't think I'd ever say that I was necessarily excited to do it. There was always like some prepping in my head or like having to, you know, um, get myself motivated to do it. So like you're saying, there is some like mental discipline that comes along with doing it because totally, you know what I'm saying? So it does kind of build up that whole mental psyche thing as well. Um, Yeah. Yeah, Like would I rather go for a walk in the park and drink some coffee than be shivering cold? Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) of course. (laughs) Yeah. None of that affects the payoff. And I think I've read many times, like whether it was Benjamin Franklin or other people like way hundreds of years ago, they would say that the best way to cure or like fight off any type of cold or flu or immune bug is jumping into the river. And so it's interesting that the pendulum has swung back towards in that direction recently, where I think if you were to tell your friends or my wife still thinks I'm crazy, that if you're going to go jump in the river in Montana in January with with basically just uh, compression shorts on, they would they call you crazy, but, yeah. but the benefits are there. And especially like during the past year, during COVID and you're trying to fight off all these immune viruses and whatnot. I didn't get sick once. I haven't gotten sick for two, three plus years, at least that I know of. And I pay a large part of that to all these different habits I'm doing, such as cold water plunges, sauna. Of course, the diet's uh, locked and loaded and my light environment is locked and loaded. So yeah, yeah. it's prevention and medicine. Yeah. This podcast interview was brought to you by the Longev Revive Cream. If you haven't heard of this cream before, go back and listen to the podcast interview with David Horneck, one of the people that helped create this amazing cream. The cream is specifically developed to enhance red light therapy treatment sessions. And not only that, but improve vibrational healing from the frequencies of full spectrum sunlight. The Revive includes special ingredients such as photodynamic amino acids, which helps convert UV light to red light. It increases production of this thing called fibronectin, which is said to be the holy grail of anti-aging. And then there's astaxanthin, which has been shown in clinical studies to increase skin moisture, moisture retention, and elasticity. There's turmeric, which contains an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and antimicrobial properties. There's copper peptides, which also has antioxidant, anti-inflammatory effects. C60 has high antioxidant power to prevent skin aging, 172 times more than vitamin C. And then there's also geranium rose, shungite, humic acids. And most of these ingredients are organic and they're all high, high quality. So if you want to check this cream out, go to longev.com. That's L-O-N-G-E-V-V.com. Or you can also find it on biolite.shop. That's biolite.shop. Especially with you guys being heavy into the biohacking space, what would you say are the top biohacks for 2021, whether it's the same old, same old, or like some new up and coming stuff? Oh gosh, where do we begin? (laughs) I think the free biohacks are really important just because there are still a lot of people that are maybe home a lot more than they're used to. Maybe they're a little bit tighter on money because they can't work right now. Things like that. I would say the free biohacks that I wish I was hearing on the news, get outside, get in the sun, It right? At least just 20 minutes, full exposure or as much exposure as you can, wherever you live. <laughs> Grounding, get your feet on the earth, get outside of your house, put your feet in the grass. That's totally free. You know, just go for a walk. Walking is one of the greatest forms of exercise. You know, if we look at like the blue zones around the world, they're not all hitting up the CrossFit gym six days a week, right? They're just walking, they're biking, they're staying active. They're not sitting on their butts watching Netflix. So I think those are the top three completely free things that everyone can be doing right now. And all of those, of course, are going to support your immune system, um, anything that lowers stress. Um, I'm really big on sleep, biohacking your sleep. Of course, there's a lot of free things you can do, but the aura ring is a great kind of advisor to optimizing your sleep. So I would say, do whatever you need to do to learn about your sleep. You can just use an app. You can get the aura ring or other tech, but learn what's affecting your sleep. What's improving it. What's making it worse. Cause sleep is, I think the greatest biohack for your immune system, right? Just one night of being sleep deprived. We see causes immune dysfunction for probably 48 to 72 hours after. And I'm just throwing some things out there. Lauren, do you want to 
Yeah. I want to double down on the sleep. I always think about when I was on my first Broadway tour, I'm a performer and there was a guy in our company that drank all the beer. He ate all the pizza. He was a little bit overweight, but he was an amazing sleeper and he was really joyful. He was always laughing, smiling, hugging people, and he slept like a bear. And I was not a great sleeper at the time, even though I was quote unquote healthy. I was super stressed about my health, trying to do all of the right things. And I was actually adding way too much stress to my body. Wasn't sleeping. I was getting sick all the time and he wasn't. And I was like, what is that? What's happening with that guy right there? Yeah. Now I know that like Renee said, sleep can repair so many, I don't want to say it eliminates your bad choices, but if you're not sleeping, nothing else is going to work correctly. And then beyond the free biohacks, we always like to start there. I think everything Renee said is wonderful. I think in this last year, something that's really important is just knowing your personal risk. I think something that the news and the powers that be have failed to mention is that we are not in a one size fits all situation. Everyone's biochemistry and biology is very different. And so that means that our health outcomes are going to be very different. So there's so many resources available to us as biohackers now. So if you are able to go beyond the free biohacks, spend a little bit of money, there's so much testing you can do. Something as simple as knowing your vitamin D status, knowing your inflammatory markers, knowing your hormone levels, so much you can do on that preventative side rather than listening to advice to stay inside, not get any light, not get any hugs, and then just like wait for whatever comes. There's so much that we can do on the front end. And I would add to the metabolic health piece, something that's getting a little bit more popular this year is a CGM, continuous glucose monitor. You know, years ago you had to be diabetic to get one, but now it's you know, it's not super cheap at the moment, but most people can get their hands on one. And I think like Lauren said, metabolic health is really key right now. If you look at the people that are ending up in the hospital, right? Like 90% are overweight. So if that's something that we can all do to control our risk, why not? So CGM, I think is a really big thing. And hopefully that's going to keep taking off and just be easy to get. Maybe insurance will even cover it. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, that'd be amazing because we're not saying that diabetes is the actual risk, but blood sugar dysregulation sets up your system for that metabolic dysfunction, which causes obesity, inflammation, cardiovascular disease. So yeah, I agree. CGM is amazing. And so let's just speak to CGM for those who aren't familiar with it or know just a little bit about it. Why would you use it, you know, as a quote unquote biohacker? What's it going to tell you or what can you learn from it? So what we learned about blood glucose way back when in in nutritional education is that there is a glycemic index. And if you eat said fruit, your blood sugar is going to spike. And if you eat this, maybe it won't, but we know that we are so unique and can react to different types of bacteria in our food. Um, Some of us are a little bit more carb sensitive and this individualized component requires that feedback. So quantification and what I love about the CGM is it's not just about food. So obviously food can be a stressor to the body and we don't want elevated blood glucose for too much time because that represents a stress response. So we want to kind of come up and come back down, have your recovery period, same as after a workout. But what we're also seeing with the CGM is that you can have these stress levels and glucose responses to emotional stressors, environmental stressors, exercise, poor sleep. If you don't sleep well, your glucose could be like the craziest roller coaster of all time for the next day. So I've had some pretty amazing revelations with my CGM. Like if I happen to be running late somewhere and then I'm chronically stressed throughout the rest of the day, my blood glucose will stay elevated and tends to not come back down. So it's really important to step back and get that feedback because if you don't always feel it, I've noticed that when I have a a spike, I'll check and then I'll check in with my body. Like I just had no idea. Like there were no symptoms. There was no feeling that would connect me to that number. And so without the number, I never would have known. So it's kind of like a aura ring where there's a cause and effect. Oh, I just ate 30 minutes before I went to bed or, oh, I had two or three glasses of wine. What happened to my recovery? What happened to my sleep score? So with the CGM, you can see, of course, nutritionally, what affects your blood sugar. But then like you're saying, different stressors throughout the day, do they affect or do they not affect your blood glucose that much? So that's that's pretty interesting. You know what you said, Lauren, as far as you can't always feel it, but 
the the glucose monitor will tell you. And so then you can use that information going forward so you can make smarter decisions or you can try to be more, um, if it's a stressing event, being mindful of it to hopefully being able to mentally be in tune with that so that you can not have elevated blood glucose all the time because that's going to yeah not be good long-term, of course. <laughs> Yeah, Renee but the integration is the biggest piece. I know Renee has some thoughts on that. The what is? <laughs> the integration. You get all this this feedback. What do you do with the feedback? Exactly. That's right. the next bit. <laughs> Plus, that is biohacking, right? Half of it's collecting the data. The other half is figuring out what to do and what changes to make. But I will say, you know, for anyone that can't get their hands on a CGM, I do still think just getting a glucose monitor can be really helpful. You should always know your fasting glucose, right? First thing in the morning, check that, see where you're at. And then if you want to test a meal, I always recommend testing your glucose one hour after a meal and then two hours after a meal. And you can learn a lot about that particular meal just by doing that. But like Lauren said, you're not going to be pricking your finger to see what did that stressful event do? What did that lack of sleep do? Like you're going to be covered in band-aids all over um, if you start doing that. So that's where the CGM can be really helpful. And I think people will be shocked at what foods spike their glucose and what foods don't. It's so different for everyone. And I recommend if you can just get like a two week or four week test, test everything you can learn as much as you can, and then take that thing off your arm and try and learn more of the intuition, stick with what you learned, but don't feel like it has to be a lifelong thing. Yeah. It's, it's a good metric. It's a good tool to have to learn and move forward. But just like taking supplements, like you guys were alluding to earlier, if you're not taking blood tests or if you're not checking in with your, your biometrics somehow, then how do you know what you're using is actually working? It could be a complete waste of money or it could be worth its weight in gold, but you'll never know unless you're checking in with yourself. Yeah. And just to circle back to sleep, like you guys were saying, you can't out nutrition, bad sleep. You can't out exercise, bad sleep. You can't even, I don't think, out meditate or do that kind of stuff, <laughs> bad sleep. So like you guys are saying, that's the foundation. The circadian rhythm, having that normalized, having that optimized is, is the foundation. And then also yeah. you guys are, you know, naturally, you know, excited about and passionate about biohacking for women. So what kind of things do you guys do or learn about or utilize specific to women as it relates to biohacking? Yeah. I, well, I think the number one thing just we like to help women with is learning how to track their cycle. This is something you'll be shocked how many women have no idea what day of the month it is, what's happening, where, what are your hormones doing at different days. So number one, just track your cycle, get an app. There's plenty of free apps. I like the Glow app. Lauren, use a different one, but just learn to track what day it is. And then you can actually optimize things based off of what day it is. So you know, week one, maybe you do more restorative exercise. Week two, you can do more strength building, muscle mass building kind of exercises. You can really go strong, schedule that big presentation at work right around ovulation. You know, like you can optimize your schedule and lifestyle based off of this. And it's practically free. So I think that's the number one thing we like to help women start with. <laughs> Except for on the days when you probably can't call out of work. <laughs> you know, sometimes the schedule doesn't line up perfectly, but yeah. we try our best. <laughs> yeah. You're like, oh yeah. <laughs> but also a woman. you can optimize nutrition relative to where the cycle is as well. Correct. Where some yeah. parts of the cycle, perhaps you want to be more, let's say paleo or fat heavy. Whereas other times in the cycle, you want to be more carb heavy to meet those energy demands. Right. Yeah, the so energy uptake changes and we want to match the rise and fall of estrogen and then the rise and fall of progesterone. And, um, you know, based on those rising hormone levels, a lot of women, you know, if we restrict carbohydrates, we're not going to see optimal levels of hormones. I think that's a really big mistake, or you just want to do the same thing every day of the month. You want to do the same workout every day. And that's just really not going to put you in an optimal state. I was going to say with fasting, fasting is so popular now for women, really, you want to be fasting the first week of your cycle and then post ovulation. That's when you're going to feel much better fasting. So if you're just fasting randomly throughout the month and some days you find it sucks and it's really hard and you can't get through it, it's probably based off of where you are in your cycle. And then like Lauren said too, the hormones. So the last week of your cycle building up to start your next cycle, you do want more of those carbohydrates because that is going to build your hormones to make your cycle start in a proper way. So don't be doing like fasting and keto three days before your cycle not going to feel so good. And a lot of women have experienced like the chocolate cravings, the carb cravings. I think that's intuitively that our bodies know we need more of that. 
I'm not saying go eat like a pint of ice cream, but just listen to that. Maybe you get more carbs from your sweet potatoes, yams, maybe some rice or quinoa, things like that. Um, yeah, I think we can certainly build compassion for ourselves during that time. Cause a lot of women really get down on themselves. So like, I'm craving, I'm craving, Oh, I'm like, I'm gaining weight, I'm getting fat. And it's just negativity. And that really burdens the body rather than saying, wow, I have this craving. This is what my body needs to support my hormones and probably set me up for a really good cycle next month. Let's listen to that, but also be mindful that it's clean, hopefully not too inflammatory, real food. And I think that also goes hand in hand with this mind body connection, which I think is really important in the women's health space. Women tend to ignore energetic signals because we are in a patriarchal, very male dominated society. And we know men and women all have a balance of masculine and feminine, but the masculine energy is more giving feminine is a little more receiving, not enough women know how to find that balance between saying yes and no, or giving and receiving. And that shows up in the body. So just a random, not totally random example, but one example is thyroid issues. So women can have a blockage in energy in this area of the body. I'm not saying it's a direct causation, but we can see thyroid issues if a woman is not actively expressing her voice, her needs, doesn't know how to say no, it all comes back to a balance. So I think it's always coming back to recognizing and acknowledging that the mind and the body are very intimately connected and then supporting that with clean water, clean nutrition, good sleep, all that good stuff. And are you guys familiar with Dr. Dan Pompa? Oh yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Listening to I, his podcast, or even, even years ago, I, I vividly remember him talking about fasting. That's his thing, of course. And he had like some sort of a story or anecdote where they're doing all these fasts, you know, in his family, they're all about it. And then at some points, his wife would just really crave um, some chips or something salty or something uh, sugary. And so at some point, Dr. Pompa said, you know, why don't you just listen to those cravings, give into them. And not only did it work as far as helping out with her cycle, but she was actually losing more weight by listening to those intuitive, you know, salty or sweet cravings that like you guys are alluding to, whether it's societal or personal or what have you, you feel pressure to not give into those cravings, but by listening to your body, oh, um, I think I need some, something salty. I need some crackers or I need, you know, a pinch of salt in my water by listening to those that's actually going to behoove you both physiologically. And then if you're looking for weight loss, it's kind of counterintuitive, but it actually works. So yeah, a lot of good yeah. points there. Yeah, that yeah. feast famine cycling definitely works. And I think a good rule of thumb is to listen to your intuition and then say, how can I clean up that food? So if you're craving potato chips, let's find a potato chip that is not drenched in vegetable oils. Let's find something more stable like an avocado oil, a little less processed, or I'm craving ice cream. Maybe it is a dairy-free ice cream. I'm not saying dairy is bad across the board, but most people don't respond to it favorably. And just trying to clean up that source so that you can still have the craving, the food, and then your body gets what it needs. And it's, it's actually going to be a better instructions for your body overall. Yeah. Especially yeah. the vegetable oil, like giving in, but Oof. being wise about it. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I think like, uh, to tag on to that, you know, for me, I find if I'm craving a salty food, like a potato chip, and I've never been a chip person, that's just like not my thing. I'll go do an ampule of hypertonic. Chips. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just not a chip person, but I'll do it. That ampule hypertonic, boom, craving gone. Or if I crave chocolate, yeah, I'll go take a handful of magnesium, craving gone. Right. So just learning what the different cravings could mean. And there's just sometimes really simple ways to biohack it. It's just being aware, like you're saying, being intuitive, but sometimes you have to have the knowledge or education in order to even be aware of what your body may be telling you because you don't know what you don't know. Right. Yeah. And then like, let's move on to ancestral hacking. That's another thing you guys are passionate about. So what is ancestral hacking? What does it mean? And how does one apply ancestral hacking to their life? Well, we didn't used to have all these fancy gadgets and tools and lab tests and <laughs> all the fancy expensive stuff. So ancestral hacking is just getting back to the basics. Everything that Renee started talking about earlier. 
reconnecting with nature, getting your feet on the ground, getting negative ions from the earth, getting fresh air, getting natural light, getting just as much natural light as you're getting indoor light. So many of us are spending way too much time indoors. And I think that's something that the red light can really help with, but nothing beats getting outside. It's the free stuff. It's what our ancestors were doing before technology exploded on the planet. Yeah. And I think if we can combine the ancestral hacking with the latest biohacking technology, right, do all the ancestral hacking as much as you can, but just know, okay, I I wasn't able to get outside for the sunrise sunset. I'm going to pull out my red light panel. I wasn't able to get my feet on the earth today. I'm going to pull out my grounding mat, you know, or my PMF mat, you know, trying to balance it because we all have busy lives. Sometimes we can't do all the natural things. So I think taking advantage of the technology when we need it, But again, always start with the basics as much as you can. And I've said it a multitude of times, and maybe people are sick of me saying this at this point on my podcast, but red light therapy, like these devices and technology, it would not be necessary if people were getting outside enough. That's literally what red light therapy is fixing is the deficiency in the red and near infrared spectra, you know, specifically, but to your guys' point, getting outside any form of electron is going to be good because protons are acidic, protons are inflammatory. And so whether it's stress or air or water or lack of sunlight or bad light, as in EMFs, blue light technology, those are all ways where we're going to inundate our body with protons. That's where you get systemic inflammation. That's where you see chronic diseases or just just these modern diseases. And so if there's these ways, like you guys are saying, grounding or walking along the beach, structured water, sunlight, breathing techniques, different ways to integrate or bring in more free electrons, you're going to neutralize or rebalance this this proton-electron fight. So you're going to reduce the inflammation by reducing protons, getting more electrons. So to your guys' point, all the free stuff is typically the best stuff. And if you do the free stuff, you might not need the quote-unquote expensive uh, techie gadgets. But like you're saying, modern day life is busy. So sometimes you do need these supplements or sometimes you might need red light therapy one day. So like your guys are saying, just balancing ancestral wisdom with, with this newer technology and using both to your advantage. Yeah. I think even if you are doing all the free hacks all the time, then you can still use red light, all these other devices to just up level. Like they could potentially make you superhuman. Renee and I are always wondering like, what are the Olympic athletes doing? What are all the professional athletes doing? You know, they're doing something to get an edge. So I don't think that there's really a limit here. I think do everything and then you can keep going. You can keep raising the ceiling to your own potential. Absolutely. It just depends on what your goal is, right? But to your point, I mean, this is a good segue into longevity because that's kind of where this conversation is going. You can do all the foundational stuff to have optimal health and wellness. But if you're looking into the future and you're looking at how many decades can I tack on, not just of lifespan, but with health span. So living into your 70s, 80s, 90s with the same energy and vitality that you do in your 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, wow. With that being said, what are you guys looking at from a technology or nutritional or or biohacking standpoint to improve not just your health and wellness, but your longevity? Yeah, I think a couple of things. I mean, supplement wise, some things I'm really into right now are like NAD, spermidine. I think we're going to see that kind of break through a lot more this year. Um, things like that are going to definitely help with longevity. And you're right with health span. Like, I don't want to live till I'm a hundred. If I'm just going to be like laying in a bed somewhere watching TV, like I no, <laughs> I will check out before that. I like to joke that I want to be skiing in my nineties. So, no. um, yes. Me too. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, I think NAD and spermidine, I would put at the top of my list for like supplements on the biohacking side of things, anything that's going to improve your heart rate variability. I'm really big on that for longevity. So that's why the aura ring can be so helpful. You briefly mentioned breath work. Breath work again is a free thing. And that is the quickest way you can change your HRV. Like within a minute, you can do that. You can also change the pH of your body. Obviously, you can calm down the nervous system. So many amazing benefits just from breath work. But also for longevity, movement. Lauren's really big on this, uh, just daily movement. So not overstressing your body at the gym, but also staying active on your recovery days. Recovery is so important. And that's one of the reasons why I like the red light so much because it helps me recover faster. Oh, sleep wise. I think there's some really cool technology coming out. I'm excited to see where it gets to be in the next year or two, as far as these smart beds. My only concern with them right now is the EMF levels, 
But I think if someone can hack the EMF side of it and get these beds that are matching our body temperature, measuring our breathing, our respiratory rate, our heart rate, our body temperature, and adapting to us throughout the night, I think we can see amazing things with sleep improvement if we can hack the EMF side of things. Um, Again, that sleep is going to help with longevity and health span big time. Before moving on to you, Lauren, um, just a couple questions for Renee. NAD is good for energy levels, of course, right, with the mitochondria. So for those not familiar, what is spermidine? And then you're high on breathing, of course, many benefits there. So what are are one or two techniques that are your favorite uh, breathing techniques? Yeah, I mean, something really simple that I always recommend to clients is just box breathing, inhaling for four, holding for four, exhaling for four, holding for four. You can do that anywhere, anytime. Um, there's more advanced breathing techniques. If you want to look at, you know, Patrick McEwen's work, Wim Hof's work, Wim Hof's app, a lot more advanced things. But if you're new to it, just start with box breathing. Um, another really cool biohack I like is the leaf device. So that's something that you just strap onto your chest and it's measuring your HRV in real time. And it's telling you what rate you need to inhale and exhale based off of your HRV. So that's dealing with more like the coherence. And I think that's just such a super, super cool piece of tech. Because of course, HRV, just by doing like box breathing, you're probably going to boost your HRV, right? But if we can take it to the next level with something like the Leaf device or Elite HRV, things like that, that are really doing real-time HRV data. Um, and then I think your other question about spermidine. So if anyone's not familiar with that, the main thing is it's, it's supporting autophagy in the body. So autophagy is that body uh, body process of cleaning out kind of the bad cells, right? It's like taking out the trash. We need that. We need that cell turnover and anything that supports autophagy, even just, I mean, exercise does, sleeping, fasting, all of those things can support that. But spermidine, um, I think, can take it to the next level of boosting that. Gotcha. Perfect. All right. Moving on to Lauren, let's hear it. Longevity. (laughs) What are you doing or what are you thinking of? Just, I want to tag onto the breath work because I am obsessed with that. <laughs> I'm, I am a huge fan of the Wim Hof app. I do that most days, but I think for a lot of people, if you can recognize that there is any faulty pattern in your breathing, which is the case in many of us. And Renee and I are a great example. We grew up doing ballet dancing where we had to hold in our stomachs and we were conditioned to not breathe into your belly and as a performer too, you know, you put on a tight costume and that really creates this dysfunctional breathing pattern, which puts you into that fight or flight sympathetic state. So breathing apps are really wonderful, but also just putting your hands on your belly and practicing, not just inhaling into your belly, lungs, chest in the sagittal plane, which would be four, but transverse like 360, really trying to expand all the way around your rib cage. And what you want is to have two thirds of the air coming into your belly and then the last third into your chest. And a lot of people you'll see, you can watch the chest rises, the belly doesn't really, or maybe the chest and then the belly. It's all out of order or it's not optimal. So you could be really kind of locked up in either position and you really want that full expansion. And the exhale is super important for tapping into that parasympathetic. So Breathwork may be the best biohack of all time, especially in this last year with increased anxiety and fear and depression. We can do so much to affect our nervous system just just through breath. For longevity, Renee mentioned I love mobility. I am a personal trainer. I'm a movement coach. And I don't like to put a lot of stress on my body. I think it is important for that adaptation. We want that hormetic stress to put strain on the muscles, on our cardiovascular system, but it's all to your tolerance. And then just a little bit beyond just like the cold and infrared. So what I find is even better for longevity is mobility, moving your joints through a full range of motion. It's not only going to protect you from injuries, but you're getting that blood flow circulation. You're pumping oxygen through the entire body. It feels good. It energizes you and you're probably going to sleep better. You're going to show up to your next workout stronger. And you're probably not going to conk out because you just killed yourself in a workout. Uh, I love CrossFit. Renee loves 
used to do CrossFit and does Orange Theory. I love those high intensity workouts. So I think it's really a balance of listening to your body and making sure that it's not seven days a week, stress, stress, stress on your body. The mobility, as long as you're getting like your, your recommended dose of cardiovascular work of strength training, the mobility is something you can do virtually every single day. And I want to not only ski in my nineties, but a really big goal of mine is to not ever be in a wheelchair. I want to be able to get up off of the floor without someone helping me. That's really important to me that my body can function in, in that span of health span, not lifespan. And that seems pretty reasonable if you have the right <laughs> daily habit. I mean, really, because getting off the floor takes upper body strength, takes mobility, takes balance, especially when you're in your you know upper, upper decades. So, so to your point, is some people can't and that's 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 a realism but at the same time it shouldn't be that way i mean if you're instilling like you're saying strength and cardio and, and mobility there's no reason why you can't do that on your own for your entire life and just to kind of tack yeah. on your mobility points um like when i was in physical therapy school one of my professors would always say lotion is the motion of the joint and, yes. it, and, it, and it really is the use it or lose it principle. If you don't move your hips mm-hmm. or if you don't move your knees to end range of motion consistently, then you're going to start losing those end ranges or your end ranges are going to become lesser and less and less. So over time, pretty soon you're walking or moving like a stiff board and, and that's where your balance really goes down the drain too. So yeah, that's a good point. Mobility is pretty undervalued. And I'm a physical therapist. I'm even saying that like, I know of a dynamic stretching routine I should be doing every day, but I don't. But I should. But <laughs> we I'm, all know of things we should be doing. <laughs> I know. Don't quite make it in. Always. There's always going to be more. Always. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't do as much mobility as I would like to, but it is definitely a practice. And of course, just using intuition to move your body. I don't like it when I've been sitting for too long. My body will tell me to move. And that's because I know what it feels like to feel good. And I think once you feel that consistently enough, you don't ever want to go back to not feeling good. No, that's think, a good point. Right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Once you've had a taste of, let's call it freedom for your body when it's feeling health and vibrant, like why would it go back to not that? So, um, exactly. Let's, let's, we're getting short on time here. So let's talk about red light therapy. You guys have mentioned it a couple of times, but how do you guys use it in your daily regimen? Have you used it for specific things like pain or, or skin conditions or, or, uh, sleep? Um, how do you use it? What have you noticed? Do you use it with your clients? Et cetera. Yeah, I'll everything. jump in first. <laughs> yeah, I know everything. Um, I would say the biggest thing I've noticed is for pain relief. I my left knee has just been my stubborn knee for 20 years. <laughs> the pain comes and go goes, you know, I do all my stretching and things the best I can, but the red light has been, I would say, a game changer for that. So pain and inflammation. I also really like it for circadian rhythm, right? Getting back to like the light exposure, getting enough of that and then skincare too. So I like doing it on my face. I don't know if it's making a difference yet. I'm hoping it's keeping me young. You know, I'm 30, almost 35 and I'm still getting carded uh, when I go to a bar. So I guess that's, um, that's <laughs> yeah. you're doing okay. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully it's helping with the collagen. Um, and yeah, I recommend it to my clients all the time. Anyone that can afford it, um, I would say just start with like the smallest panel and work your way up over time. Do you have specifics for how you use it for pain or for circadian rhythm? Because people are always asking me, of course, I have my ebook, which has specific protocols. But one of the biggest questions is timing of using red light therapy. So you said you use it for circadian rhythm. Does that mean you use it first thing in the morning and right before you go to bed? Are you always using red and near infrared or are you choosing red or near infrared based on what you're trying to treat? Great question. So I, I probably all things I can be better about. So I, mine is just red and near infrared. I'm not switching back and forth. As far as timing, I would love to do it at sunset. I mean, maybe you can correct me if there's a better time, but if I can't do it at sunset, I do it whenever I can. I do find if I do it too late at night, it can be too stimulating if I do it on my face. So at night I'll do it more like on my back, my knee, my abdomen. I won't do a face at night even with my eye blocker things, it just right. seems a little too energizing for me. So you um, get energized yeah. by doing other parts of your body, just your face or brain area. Yeah, that's what I've noticed. And that's kind of the yeah. answer I give people is just like we've been talking about with biohacking, it's bio-individual. So 
if you're trying to do no normalize your circadian rhythm, yes, try to do it sunrise, sunset, but be careful of sunset uh, because if it's within an hour of going to bed, you need to know if you're relaxed or if you're energized by red light therapy. Because if you're energized, well, that's not going to behoove your circadian rhythm. So uh, you do need to find yeah. out if you get energized or not. If you don't, great. Do it right before you go to bed. If you do, you know, do it 90 to 120 minutes before you go to bed. Yeah, th those are good points. Good to know. Awesome. Lauren. <laughs> I'm the same. I'm the same as Renee. I think it is a little bit energizing to me. So at nighttime, I try to keep it like chin down. I'll use it on, I love using it on my gut stomach area because we know that goes right to the brain. And then for pain inflammation, I'm a dancer. So I've had a million things wrong from the waist down and I can feel it when the light has been on there for a consistent amount of time. You get like that tingling, you feel the blood flow. I believe in that, that, that power, that energy that I feel. And during the day, it's definitely a mood booster because my apartment's a little bit darker. If I notice I'm starting to get a little lethargic, if I just flip that switch on, I do the near and far infrared. I find that without eating or drinking anything or doing some jumping jacks that naturally my energy will just kind of lift a little bit. And I think they've showed this in studies. I know they studied rats before humans with red light, and they found that if they covered the eyes of the rats, it did not have the same effect on pain, inflammation, and mitochondrial function. When their, their eyes were exposed, they really had a big benefit. So I do think there is something to the nighttime routine. And I, I agree. It's hmm. probably personal. You have to see if it is affecting your energy. Is that My really dog loves it. <laughs> your dog loves it. Yeah. A lot of people post about their animals, dogs, uh, cats, horses. I haven't seen any birds yet, but I mean, they have mitochondria yeah. too, so they're, they can benefit as well. Um, but yeah, I, I will say a really quick story about my cat. Um, she back in February, she was diagnosed with lymphoma and we decided to not do chemo. We were doing all the natural alternative stuff. And one of the things was I would put my red light out on the floor. She would go and lay next to it 10 to 20 minutes. And then she'd get up and walk away. And then she'd go back later. It was like, she intuitively like knew like, yeah. okay, I got my, my dose. I take a little break. Isn't it funny that animals like cats and dogs know to do that with red light therapy panels, but we don't know to walk outside and get some sun every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> they are I mean, much smarter more in tune with ancestral hacks. They just know they yeah. can't read Google. So <laughs> they just know. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so for both of you with pain, cause this is another one, chronic pain is so much tougher to treat than like an acute pain. So when you guys are saying you use it for pain, how quickly do you notice results? Is it instantaneously or does it take multiple sessions or multiple weeks? I, for my knee pain, I, I would say I'm really fortunate, especially as someone that did ballet for 25 years. My only trouble spot is my left knee. <laughs> but when I do the red light for 10 minutes, it works right away. It's pretty fast. That's yeah, fair. I guess it depends how chronic it is. I mean, there's so many variables there. I would say the longer it's been there, the more it, it takes. But I also notice if I look at other variables, you know, what did I eat yesterday? Did I have any alcohol? Did I sleep? Obviously, that's going to increase the pain and red light's not going to take that away in completely. But I think acutely, the results seem to be pretty immediate. That's pretty powerful. And I know from other people I've spoken to, or dealing with chronic headaches, migraines for decades, um, when they first got one of their, their red light therapy panels, they turned it on, stepped in front of it when they had, you know, a headache migraine episode. And they said instantaneously it went away. And she works in a clinic. She's, she is a naturopathic doctor on the East coast. And so she has it in her clinic. And so on subsequent days or weeks, when this was happening, she did it again. And pretty much every single time she stepped in front of it and her, her headache or migraine would dissipate or, or disappear. So Amazing. pretty darn powerful wow. for something that's, invisible if it's near infrared or if it's the red light, but just, just the power of light. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is the question I always ask people is if, if someone's sitting on the fence and they're just kind of learning about red light therapy, what would you tell them to kind of move them or nudge them in the direction of at least trying a red light therapy device? Well, I, whenever I think of red light, I always think of one of our friends, what he said, he's kind of an expert on red light. He said, Red light does only one thing, but it does it really, really well. And that's talking about the mitochondria. I don't know how much you agree with that, Mike. Um, but I, I don't know that, about, like, I don't know about one thing, but 
Yeah. As far as mitochondrial health, yes, it does that exceptionally. I would agree. But yeah. just because it helps the mitochondria doesn't mean that explains how it improves circulation or how it reduces inflammation. I mean, it's kind of an right. interwoven story, but that's kind of myopic to say just mitochondria. But but to his point, yeah. yes, it, it boosts mitochondrial health exceptionally. That's proven time and time mm-hmm. again. Yeah. So I would say if that's just one motivation, it's just to boost mitochondrial health. Um, right. If your mitochondria aren't healthy, your cells aren't healthy, then your organs aren't healthy, then your systems aren't healthy. Right. It works up from there. And of course, we can dump in supplements, CoQ10, PQQ, NAD. We can dump all these things in to support mitochondria. But I think if we can do it with a red light panel, like I said, start with a small one if you're not sure. Yep. Yeah. Huge bang for your buck. Yeah, that's what I always tell people too. It's low risk, high, high reward as far as yeah. it's extremely safe, but as far as the health and wellness and longevity benefits, they're they're pretty sky high if you use it correctly. Right. Yeah. Renee and I always like to dare people to feel bad after trying something like that. Like I dare you to feel bad <laughs> after the sauna or cold or doing some mobility. Like I dare you to not feel good after the red light. I have yet to meet anyone that after just a one single session that they walk away and they're like, eh, haven't met them yet. <laughs> I, have, I have a caveat to that. And that is yeah, if someone is using it for the first time and they're not extremely healthy, then they could have like a detox symptom, like where they get a little woozy or they get some headaches or you know what I'm talking about? It's the initial Herxheimer. Yeah. So, uh, a sauna for the first time or, or even a cold plunge for the first time, you might get those detox symptoms, but of course you do it multiple times after that. Then you start to see um, the benefits and the energy and, and the vitality. But, but to your point, well, hopefully they can that. see the benefit in that because that's a release of energy. That's things moving and moving in the right direction. So feeling something is actually a really positive thing. We never promise that biohacking is all comfortable and and feels good. You know, there's a little discomfort involved, but I think just feeling anything is a sign that something could be shifting. Yep. And another another one's hyperbaric chamber because of course that's opening up passageways that could have been closed for years. So same thing. Um, yeah. yeah. If the person's aware of what it is, yeah, then yes, you can kind of take some consolation in that it's the process moving in the right direction. Yeah. Right. And I think with any biohacking, start slow, right? You can react to anything, any supplement, any biohack, you can always react. So start slow. Also do one thing at a time, right? Don't add 10 biohacks the same day. <laughs> Not going to feel so good. Be a responsible biohacker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, guys, where can people go to learn more about you, whether it's individually or, you know, as your biohacking babes conglomerate? Our website is thebiohackerbabes.com. We are predominantly on Instagram for social media, biohacker underscore babes. Our podcast is Biohacker Babes. We are on pretty much any channel. We release every Monday morning once a week. And my personal page is Lauren underscore Sam Batero, also on Instagram a little bit on Facebook by default. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm more Instagram too, just at Renee Bells, all one word. Gotcha. Yeah. Perfect. Well, guys, I really appreciate your time. This was a really fun conversation. Um, just, you know, bouncing some biohacking knowledge off each other. I'm sure the audience is going to learn a lot. And um, yeah, hope you guys have a wonderful day. Uh, appreciate you both, Renee, Lauren. And uh, any last words for people as far as what they can do, what biohacking they can integrate to improve their health and wellness today. We probably already mentioned it, but if there's anything else. I will throw one thing out there. Um, I think find a way to connect with other people. That's maybe one thing we didn't talk about too much. I think community is maybe not as popular of a biohack, but it should be. So even if you're struggling because today, whatever you're stuck at home, find ways to connect with people other than just messaging on Instagram. Get out there, get some hugs if you can. Lauren and I will be at the biohacking conference coming up next month. If anyone's going to be there, please reach out to us. We'd love to see you and meet up in person and connect with us online. Um, I think just find that community, people that really believe similar thoughts and want to upgrade their health. I think we all need to stay connected. Yeah. Or just have some healthy discourse. That's fun too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially I would, last year. I mean, yeah, that, that's extremely important. Oh, so yeah. Important. Yeah. I just want to add to that. I think our biggest resource for our health is 
the wisdom of our own body, our intuition can be so strong if we can learn to listen to that. And that's a huge thing that we try to educate on at the Biohacker Babes. We all have intuition. Some of us are a little disconnected to it, but it is always there. And if you're having trouble connecting to it or finding it, you just need to create time and space. That's why this whole mindset practice, spirituality, maybe it's meditation, breathwork, or just 10 minutes away from your phone, having that quiet time gives your body space to communicate with you. And then if you can listen to that, then you're going to need your devices less and less. I'm not saying throw away all your devices. They're helpful, but your body's intuition is more powerful than any piece of technology out there. And if you need support along the way, of course, hire a practitioner to, you know, give some accountability and support, but it is within you already. Everyone has it. I love those points. Um, you know, staying connected with your community, staying connected with your close and loved ones. And then on the flip side, disconnect from your phone and just being more intuitive with your own body. I mean, those two things alone are going to, like I asked for, one thing people could do to improve their health and wellness. Well, there you go. There's two big ones. So I appreciate you guys and your answers. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, guys, appreciate your time. Appreciate your energy. I'm sure we'll cross paths again. Um, I but hope so. Renee, Hopefully. Yeah, for Renee and Lauren. This is Mike Belkowski signing off another episode of The Red Light Report. Everybody have a fantastic week. Thank you for listening to The Red Light Report. If you like what you heard today, go ahead and leave us a review on iTunes and other podcast platforms to help spread the word so other people can learn about the many health, wellness, and longevity benefits of red light therapy. If you're looking for more educational content, check out our Instagram page at biolight.shop and our YouTube channel, Biolite. I'm Dr. Mike Belkowski, and I'll see you on the next episode.